Good evening and welcome to the Yale and U.S. College Tan Tin Chuan Lecture Theater. My name is Barbara from the class of 2025. I major in psychology and minor in economics here at Yale and U.S. College. Before we begin, I have a couple of administrative announcements. First, please do not take photos or videos of tonight's session. Second, we will be entertaining audience questions towards the latter half of this evening during the Q&A segment after the lecture. For those of you who are here in the lecture theater, please raise your hands during the Q&A segment if you have a question and our ambassadors will hand the microphone to you. Please speak into the microphone so that our online audience can hear you as well. For those who are participating online through Zoom, please submit your questions to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Now please join me in welcoming the Yale and U.S. College Head of Studies of Anthropology, Associate Professor Nur Amali Ibrahim. Prof. Amali, please. Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for being here. Today's talk is sponsored by the Yap Kim Hao Professorship in Comparative Religious Studies. Uh, I want to say a few words about the late Reverend Yap Kim Hao. He was a tireless defender of people at the margins, and he was especially known for his work with LGBTQ communities, people living with HIV AIDS, um, refugees, as well as migrant workers. Uh, Reverend Yap was also a great believer of cross-cultural understanding. He believed that if we understood something about uh, each other's religions, perhaps uh, this is how we might be able to create a better world. And I think that sense of curiosity about other people, people who are very different from us, uh, people who behave and think very differently from us, this is something uh, 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 that anthropology also very much uh, tries to practice. And, and I think this is also the goal of today's uh, talk. Uh, uh, which will introduce uh, you to, I think, uh, uh, religious practice and a context that may not be familiar to many people in Singapore. Um, let me say a few words about our speaker today. <clears throat> Professor Seema Golestane uh, received her PhD from the Department of Anthropology at Columbia University and currently is a an associate professor at the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Cornell University. She is broadly interested in the anthropology of Islam and geographically speaking, she uh, studies the Persian speaking world. The talk today, Unknowing and the Everyday Sufism and Knowledge in Iran, is based on her recently published uh, book of the same title, and um, it, this was released in last year, I want to say, in uh, 2023. And it is available on the NUS library as an ebook. And if you've not read it yet, I highly recommend that you do because Professor Golestani is such a beautiful writer. And um, a word that we used yesterday in uh, my talk was wordsmith. And I think you are such a wordsmith, Seema. Um, so uh, if, if uh, for those of you who are writing your capstone and one is one, uh, wish to have an, uh, an example of what beautiful writing looks like, please have a look at Professor Golestani's book. Um, I think uh, you are in for a treat today. So uh, without further ado, let us welcome our speaker, Professor Seema Golestani. Um, thank you to Yale and US uh, for the support, um, and also to Freya, who was so kind and um, it's not easy uh, organizing international travel, so it's very much appreciated. Um, I've also um, really appreciated learning more about Yap Kim Hao uh, and the, you know, the professorship um, for which, which sponsors this talk. Um, he really seemed a remarkable figure, and as Professor Amali was saying, you know, provided support for those at the margins, um, especially during a time when it was not particularly acceptable. Um, and at risk to himself. So I will look to his memory as we navigate these you know, often difficult times. Um, I'll also thank my interlocutors in their absence. And I told a few of them that you know, I was coming here today and I'm taking you know, Islamic mysticism or Sufism to Singapore and they were excited. And one of them, um, he always joked, he said, you know, I'm still waiting for my honorary doctorate. And I said, I promise I'm working on it. But it's to them that I owe all these um, 
uh, thoughts. Um, so, uh, as Professor Amali mentioned, you know, I'm going to talk about mostly a case study from my book today, but I'll give a little bit of background information before getting into it. Um, so my work is with different uh, Sufi orders throughout Iran. Um, these are disparate Sufi collectives, and I worked mostly in the cities of Esfahan, Kerman, and Tehran, and to a lesser extent Shiraz. And these were all Persian-speaking, Shia-identified uh, Sufis. Uh, who claim some lineage with a saint from the 14th century. Um, so some of these collectives are part of large orders um, with an established history and branches throughout Iran. Others are much more sort of casual, more congregation style, much more recent. Um, and they all live the lives of non, very typical of non-Sufis. You know, they went to work, they went to school. Um, they also, um, you know, looked very identical for the most part, for most people, to just everyday other Iranians, uh, or at least other ethnic Persians. And they came from a wide array of class backgrounds. And so I'd be happy to speak more about the demographics of the group in Q&A. Um, but really today I'd like to discuss one unifying feature um, of these disparate mystical collectives, their particular interpretive stance toward mystical knowledge, or uh, what I translate, uh, or the term they use is matrafat. Sure, yeah, go ahead. Well, matrafat is typically translated as gnosis, which is, you know, G-N-O-S-I-S. I translate matrafat, or mystical epistemologies, as unknowing. Um, and so, sort of a side note, matrafat is a very, very complicated term with a long history, and there are many, many interpretations. But when I'm using it here, I'm just referring to the interpretation of my interlocutors. And so what I found in my research was that for my interlocutors, Sufism was not an escapist or transcendent kind of phenomenon, but something that held real application for their everyday lives. Uh, oftentimes we think of mysticism, we think of things that are not tied to the material world, the social world, you know, almost by definition, it's something else. Um, but I, they said that it actually was something that they used to help navigate their everyday lives. And so with that, I realized I had to think very seriously about what it means to be a Sufi um, when they talk about these very kind of abstract concepts. Uh, for example, the idea of fana, and I'll talk a little bit more about this today. So the idea of fana, F-A-N-A, it's often translated as annihilation of the self or disillusion of the self, like the fading away. And so annihilation of the self, you know, that's quite a heady term. Um, but what I think is important to think about is that the Sufis are not thinking about it as a metaphor. They're thinking about it as an actuality. So as the anthropologist, I really have to take this quite seriously. You know, so what does it mean to think about this type of subjectivity or, or selfhood that can emerge uh, when the self falls away. Okay. So thinking, you know, what is unknowing now? Um, it's a concept that I think about, and I started thinking about this because the Sufis are very much invested in the idea that God is ultimately unknowable. And they want to affirm this idea that it's ultimately impossible for humans to fully understand the divine. And what's fascinating, though, is that rather than think about this as an obstacle to thinking or contemplation, these Sufis instead see an opportunity for a new type of knowledge, a new type of thinking, even. In other words, they firmly position themselves at this juncture, this limit of human thought, in developing their epistemologies, they operate from a position of accepting and emphasizing that there will be always that which we do not know. So when we think of unknowing, I'm sort of suggesting it that it's not a form of anti-knowledge or meta-knowledge, but rather it's an awareness that, uh, of that which we do not know. And it's an engaged awareness that we know nothing, essentially. And while I think it's fair to say that most Muslims are kind of down with this idea that, of course, God is unknowable, you know, of course humans can understand, 
So Sufis, again, really lean into this idea and have it as their point of, you know, jumping off point. Uh, for the contemporary Iranian Sheikh Sayyid Mustafa Osmayesh, he uh, thinks about this interminable nature of the Sufism as one of its most defining features. He says, quote, the road to God is endless because God is infinite. Constantly we have to go on and accept to go on. When you stop, you are no longer a Sufi. And so there's this idea that within unknowing, there remains some form of engaged awareness, a self-conscious sort of awareness. But it's an awareness that something remains unresolved. And as one of the highest spiritual authority figures, the Qut of the Nimutlahi Sultan Ali Shahi Sufi order uh, um, offers, he defines matter of fact as a type of knowing, but yet knowing has different stages. It's not an absolute matter. So what does it mean that we think about knowing has different stages, different forms of movement? And this is again Taubanda and I quote, it is something that, as the philosophers say, is graduated, tashkiki, such as light and faith, which have degrees. More than anything else, this process continues endlessly. Here then we see one of the first aspects of unknowing, that it contests the finality of thought, suggesting an intimation of knowing as a process without endpoint. And there again, there's always that which we do not know. So again, moving away from this idea that it's anti-knowledge or um, even sort of like a meta-knowledge, the idea is that you're thinking, but it has to constantly go on. The idea that you know something, you're okay with it, you know, you set it aside, that doesn't exist with this type of um, mystical epistemologies. And so thinking, you know, moves away as in sort of automatic, systematic, means to an end, and instead allows thinking to operate as a constantly searching, ceaselessly critical, investigative device. And unknowing is exactly that. It causes one to unknow something. It takes a seemingly concrete entity and sort of blurs its beginning and endings. It renders the once familiar into the unfamiliar and sort of vice versa to pull from the old kind of uh, anthropological kind of logic. logic. Now, quote uh, from the 11th century writer Ahmad Ghazali, as he wrote in his famous treatise, Tawane, quote, the station, matter of fact, the station is beyond the limit of reason and the elusive expression of knowledge cannot reach it any more than its outward expression, Ibarat. However, the illusion of mystical epistemologies will indicate it for unlike knowledge, the boundaries of which are well-constructed, or you know, unlike reason, the boundaries of which are well-constructed, the boundaries of mystical knowledge leads to ruin. Here is a dashing of waves on the ocean of love, breaking on themselves and returning to themselves. So it's the ruination of boundaries, that which is contained. And which is I saw again and again in my case studies. So, so far I know this has been very abstract, this is much more philosophical, um, but what I found really fascinating is again, bringing it back to the case studies and how they are able to apply these really kind of abstract ideas to what's going on. So that's really the heart of the book are these four ethnographic case studies. And in each instance, I trace how the different forms of unknowing influence the mystics' understandings of text and authority, the self, memory, and place. The first case study, I, look, I speak with two sheikhs who, uh, belie whose belief in the endlessness of the meaning of poetry and the meaning of texts uh, in other words, they think, you know, they read a text and there's an infinite amount of ways of interpreting, an infinite amount of ways of understanding. And, you know, you see this in a lot of different uh, Islamic thought. You see this also in sort of um, certain forms of Western philosophy. You know, the folks interested in the deconstructionists will kind of keep going this too. But what I found interesting with these sheikhs was that not only did they affirm this kind of endlessness of the text, they saw it as a reflection of uh, their own t authority. So when it says Islamic thought, a lot of authority comes from being able to interpret text correctly. 
Um, but what they, these uh, sheikhs were saying was like, well, we're just somebody else. We can't give you the right answers. Um, and so this limitlessness of the text they saw as um, tied to how they understood their own authority. And interestingly, one of them found this really joyous. He says, I can't give you the right answers. I can only give you the right questions, and we're just going to have fun. And another kind of felt a sense of melancholy um, and this idea that oh, he's always ultimately going to fail um, his students. Um, another case study was where I look at the musical Zeich ritual. Some of you might have seen this as like the whirling dervishes or the famous ones. Um, and how that is tied to this concept of, again, fanon, the dissolution of the self. Um, and, you know, I'm looking at the relationship between uh, music and listening and how that can help dislodge this notions of the self or closeness to God. Um, and I also kind of tie to how um, uh, philosophy uh, and forms of um, uh, this idea of loss of the self is different in a, a post-colonial context where for so long people have been talking about a return to self. You know, we've lost ourselves in the wake of foreign influence. Um, another case study I'll just mention quickly before getting to this one is this idea that um, you have a small collective of mystics who came together to revive an old practice of wandering. Uh, so literal wandering um, was something that was done a long, long time ago. The last hundred years, these Sufis have not done this, but now this young group tries to uh, revive it in a way, but they do it within an urban environment to sort of uh, inscribe their neighborhood, especially as it's tied to um, you know, having to change locations when the government is actually frowning upon them. Um, so this is just a very cursory overview of some of them, but I'm going to focus on one case study. Uh, the last thing I'll say is a little bit of a kind of disclaimer, um, or side note, I should say. I want to make clear that I don't think Sufism in, in Iran is a heterodox version, uh, and Shiism, the mainstream, is just the orthodox version. I'm happy to talk about this more in Q&A, but there is a ton of cross-pollination between the two. Um, there's a lot of political alliances between the two. So to say one is this and one is that, and between the two they shan't meet is you know, really a misconception. So, but I'm happy to talk about that more in Q&A. Okay, but well with that, finally, uh, I'll get to my case study. And this is, I'll give a little summary before, this is one of the more curious instances of uh, application of um, unknowing here where essentially there was a meeting place in the city of Esfahan, a Sufi meeting place. It's all very Sufi. Um, and what happened was the local authorities decided to uh, raise it to the ground, to destroy it. And the reason they gave was it was the... Um, sorry. The reason they gave uh, was because of beautification of the neighborhood. Um, and so the Sufis fought this until finally it was destroyed. But what happened afterwards was that it was, uh, they decided to forget the event ever happened. Um, and this is the way they sort of changed tactics, as I say, from trying to remember the site, trying to preserve the site, to collectively, actively forgetting it. Um, and so that's the case study I'll discuss today, which I'll finally get to. So now a bit of my field notes. On late Friday afternoons, the Sufis gather on the eastern side of Takht e a necropolis in Isfahan, as dusk falls. Exchanging polite greetings, they have come for sundown prayers, most carrying the small carpets, the janamas unfolded, unfurling them onto the concrete as they take their spots on the empty lot. There is still rubble along the sides of the vacated lot the high walls of another section of the cemetery complex coming to an abrupt end. The Sufis had resisted the demolish of the tomb of Nasser Ali and Takht e Fulad for nearly seven months before it was raised to the ground in the early morning hours of February 18, 2009. In late autumn of 2008, uh, 1387, a sign had been posted on the door by the municipal government, the Shahdari, that the building was in disrepair and was to be destroyed as part of the city's beautification initiative. Several members went to the Shahdari offices to inquire further on the matter, 
but the only information they were given was another printout on the sign on the door. The decision had already been made, they were informed, and it was final. Distraught, the Suvis gathered to decide what should be done about the matter. 200 years, 200 years since this building has stood here in this very spot, and now it is to be destroyed. Why would they do such a thing? Why weren't they even using, we weren't even using loudspeakers? They decided upon the following tactic. They would appeal once more to the municipal government, promising to never use the shrine again, only if it would be left alone. This was a risky move, as it was essentially calling out the city for what the Sufis suspected, suspected were the real motivations uh, behind the demolition. The site was being used as a meeting place by a group that did not have official permission to do so. So a letter was drafted and several senior men returned to the Shah Jari, the municipal government, to ask whom they might submit the letter. Um, and ultimately they decided that they would risk um, uh, the change with direct opposition, with their physical presence, their physical being. A sentry would be posted at all times at the shrine, day and night, and would alert other members via mobile phone to gather immediately at the appearance of construction vehicles. Names and numbers were taken of volunteers, both men and women, for guardians of the shrines. Day and night, they stood sentry, mobile phones fully charged and at the ready. But for months, there was nothing. People began to wonder if the municipal government's warning was just that, an empty warning, an empty threat. It was more a matter of when rather than if, they thought. In Iran, things take so long to get done, they joked, we even have to wait for unwanted actions sort of the politics of dread. And so they waited. They waited until winter's turn, when a person could no longer stand the cold during the darkest hours, when the old soul building stood empty from 10 in the evening until sunrise prayers. Still, the Sufis stood guard during the day. They stood the best they could, until someone who had a relative in the city government heard a rumor that the building was to be destroyed that very night. That night, a group of about 15 Sufis arrived and vowed to stay until morning. Wrapped under layers of clothing and clutching thermoses of hot tea, they waited. Um, ultimately, a group of five remained. Not long after the others had gone, however, the remaining dad reached the Sufis sitting on the ground, heard some shouting orders. You are illegally occupying this building and are hereby under arrest. They were taken to the police station and kept overnight in a, quote, detention room, but then were released in the morning. As the five sentries were being taken away by the authorities in the early morning hours of February 18th, 2009, a city commission bulldozer came into Takhli Fulad and raised the building to the ground. The vehicle was accompanied by a large group. Estimates were between 100 and 200 individuals, police officers, some plays clothes agents, um, uh, and after a while, in the event that a fight broke out. But there was no one there. Only some 200-year-old bricks, dusty lights, and an old grave. The neighboring library was also destroyed, the yellowing volumes of poetry and exegesis torn to pieces in the rubble. When it was gone, perhaps they were surprised by the large field of rubble left in its wake. Things always take up more space when they are in pieces. And yet something stopped the authorities from destroying the grave itself. Perhaps they felt it unnecessary since they were already removing the meeting place, leaving the Sufis with no place to gather, and they'd always, that had always been the real objective. Or perhaps something felt wrong, perhaps something stirred in them, that to destroy the final resting place of the dead would reap consequences beyond this life. Perhaps it was never part of their orders at all, but whatever the reason, the building was gone, and the grave remained, and that was all that was needed. So, given the importance of the tomb of Nasser Ali, we find something kind of remarkable, um, what happened afterwards. Namely, we see, you know, what happened here, the sort of very typical modes of resistance uh, that the Sufis put up. But after, the tactics they decided to uh, take on was the idea that the denial that this meeting place ever existed, that the destruction had not taken place and that any and all memories of the old building should be dismissed. In other words, in their desire to not place too much importance on the physical building, the physical space itself, 
that practitioners distance themselves from even this forced removal of the space. So resolved were they in their desire to dispute the memory of this building, in fact, that several of them essentially refused to speak plainly regarding the matter. Ultimately, what I find is being embraced here is an instance of a decisive refutation, a refusal of memory, a forgetting so purposeful that the material may be rendered immaterial. What has willed this vanishing act, however, cannot be called simply an instance of forgetting. When I think of forgetting, I think it's too passive. Uh, there's too many streaks of passivity, too much offhanded kind of carelessness that characterizes this treatment of the past. To forget something, even if it is caught up in the unconscious dialectics of memory, is to disregard it. But this is, I don't think, what is happening here. Um, this is a much more intentional kind of uh, action. And so I was thinking about this, and we think, you know, putting it another way, how does one remember to forget, uh, to unknow a memory, to put it to question? And perhaps the objective here is not one of forgetting, but something else, something closer to an instance of amnesia. For when we consider amnesia, we think of a phenomenon that is characterized actually by awareness. For the typical amnesiac, they're aware that there is a gap, that there is aware that there is a sort of whole past. Um, and so the order strives, I, I think actually, simply not to forget, but to induce an amnesic state. This is some parts of Takh de Foulard, not what was destroyed. I don't show those images, um, but it's largely a graveyard that's there. Um, and here are some internal images. I'll save this. Thank you. Um, so as I was saying, this is about kind of inducing an amniasic state, um, which is harder to do. Um, and, but it also has a sort of hyperconsciousness about it. One, again, is realizing there's a gap in memory. And so there's a willingness here to invoke, I think, this willful amnesia, even if it's, we could think about it, if it's fully achieved or not, is another question. But through this act of willful amnesia, through this negation of a sacred space, the actual uh, status of the building as a real thing or a not real thing has been put into question. Now, this is a material absence rather than simply a metaphysical one. Uh, in that the subject, I think, is the one who's, you know, put for the transformation. And, you know, some people often say that this is like a trauma response, but at least in classical theory, you know, the trauma acts on the subject. This, I think, is a subject acting upon the memory, uh, a conscious action um, that's happening. So I don't think it's an instance of trauma, but we can also talk about that. Um, and so at this point, I want to go into my interlocutor's, you know, discussions with me about this event, uh, which was uh, tricky to navigate, to say the least. And to put it kind of broadly, I found responses fell into sort of three different categories, um, and often correlated by how close the person was to me. The people who I was closest to, they often gave the sort of more straightforward answer. Um, namely that, uh, you know, they would talk about what transpired. So to my interlocutors, I posed a really simple, what I thought was a simple question, you know, what happened at Tartu Fulad? What happened at this site? And so some people gave answers that were pretty typical of what you would imagine. So the first group mentions, oh, it was, ter it was terrible. You know, we used to always meet in Tartu Fulad for prayers and sermons. On holidays, we would have our silent zik, you know, the um, sort of meditation remembrance ritual there. Now it's no longer there. Key acknowledgement. I was so upset when it happened. Someone else was telling me, you know, direct, uh, acknowledging me, saying, you know, it was only good that you weren't there. It was so sad. They, the Darish, the Sufis, tried so hard to stop it, and still the municipal government destroyed it. And so in these, we see full acknowledgments made and accusations. You know, there's characters. Um, they're clear actors and agents before and after are us and them. The next group gave me less straightforward answers, but there was some kind of hinting about what had happened. So I call this kind of evasion. So again, I asked folks, you know, what happened to Taqsir Fulad? And the responses were, as you see here, some of them said things like, don't worry about what happened there. So something did happen, but don't worry about it. And Takhlu Fulad, we had some problems, some difficulties, Sahti, 
there, but it wasn't important. Uh, we used to meet there, but not anymore. Interesting. And yeah, we used to go there, but it's not important to go there anymore. So here we see some, of, some recognition of misfortune or some recognition that there was something there, um, but the answers were vague, clearly. And I can also talk about when I was doing the research, it was very confusing. Uh, because when the actual destruction happened, I wasn't in Iran at the time. But I was speaking to people and I knew what had happened. And it wasn't until maybe six months later I was able to speak with lots of people. I was beyond just my friends who were associated with it. Um, so yeah, that was also quite a trip. And the last group, um, if the first group was direct acknowledgement, this group here, kind of evasive, kind of vague, the last group was outright refusal about acknowledging what happened. And I'm using the word refusal here, but you know, you can debate. Um, so refusal, again, what happened at Takhluf Lod? No, you must be mistaken, there was no tomb there. Uh, we have many places to meet, even more kind of evasive. There was never any building in Takhluf Lod. And the most sort of difficult, I'm sorry, I don't know of what you speak. So with this, I think we are witnessing a sort of direct refutation of it, that anything transpired. It's an unwillingness to know the building existed at all or the questioning of the validity of my inquiry. For this group of individuals, their responses reflected the highest form, I think, of sort of willful amnesia, um, this active and conscious erasure of memory at hand. Just looking quickly at the time. Um, I'm gonna jump a little forward. Um, and maybe we'll come back if we have time to this. What I do um, is also relate sort of these strategies of remembrance as tied to the Iranian state. Um, I'm becoming very, very quick. If we have time, I can talk more about this, about how um, the Iranian state is very much uh, invested in forms of remembrance, particularly remembrances of the Iran-Iraq war that happened in the 1980s. There's a lot of visual culture. You see a lot of murals, billboards. And so it would seem that would be kind of the opposite move of what the Sufis are doing, which this group of Sufis at least, where they're saying forget, forget, forget. Um, and the Iranian state is very much invested in remember, remember, remember. And the remember is often tied to the idea of threat. Uh, so remember what happened, it could happen again. This is why we have to be vigilant. This is why we have to remain you know, wary of any foreign powers could attack us at any time. They're quite invested in this idea. Um, and on the one hand, they are obviously quite different. And, oh, I'm sorry, I have this. These are some of the murals you might see. Um, this, is the, this is actually in Takhtifulad. They have a, the most recent graveyard is of people who died in the war. Um, and this is a very typical uh, mural you might see in Iran of a young soldier who passed away. So you see this in different cities. It is changing a bit in the last 10 years, and now they're realizing it's not the most, uh, um, you know, <laughs> effective tactic, um, especially that was 40 years ago. Um, but I do think there are some similarities in terms of activations of memory, whether it's a refutation of it or it's a insistent upon it. So there's different kind of ways that they're playing with this. Um, and again, just to sort of summarize and go through the book. Uh, and I go into the book more um, in more detail. But I do want to think a little bit more about you know, the Sufis and why they're kind of doing this here. Um, and interestingly too, they actually, until the pandemic, would continue to go to the site of the grave and gather in smaller numbers for the prayers. But I want to consider Takhlifulod and the events that transpired there. In particular, I want to think about sort of contrasting, as I mentioned earlier, the you know, direct actions, we might call it, that they were taking, you know, the very typical kind of modes of organizing, getting letters, standing sentry, with this kind of very curious, to us at least, perhaps, um, tactics that they had after. And you had these methods of direct engagement. So thinking about this, you know, they really tried to fight it. Why then, in the aftermath of the devastation, attack the Fulad, after such resistance had been mounted, such organizations, why did they you know, switch tactics so quickly? You know, why did their oppositional consciousness, you might say, seem to dissipate so quickly? And I think that it did not really disappear, it merely changed forms. 
perhaps not even changed forms, but perhaps what occurred was a shift, a shift in the way that the order wished to view the incident. Initially, the matter was approached on what might be called a societal or bureaucratic level, where attempts were made to navigate the various institu institutions and to contact appropriate authorities. Just as the excuse me, municipality claimed the reason for the destruction was, quote, beautification of the neighborhood, so too did the Suvis approach the instance as an entirely civil matter, ultimately resulting in an act not dissimilar to civil disobedience. After the de demolition, however, the mystics never contacted the authorities again, spoke only to a few media figures immediately after the event, and then in theory spoke of the matter no further. This public silence, however, did not imply that the Sufis were no longer concerned with what transpired at Takhlifulad, nor had they dismissed it completely. The incident was rather approached from an entirely different light. The terms of the debate reconfigured wholly. Now the removal of the tomb would be approached through a mystical lens. Rather than confrontation, there is evasion. Rather than direct opposition, a strange sideways tactic has been espoused. The socio-political realm abandoned in favor of one which was largely, it was largely concerned. It's in this way that the Sufi order has rendered the municipality's actions impotent. One can never lose if they never played at all. Now there's the question, of course, is this resistance? There are shades of defiance here, undoubtedly, if we were to understand resistance as in actions or thoughts explicitly reactionary to some oppositional force. More often, resistance is framed as a persecuted group taking some sort of action measure in response to a governing body. And again, I think there are shades of that here. The, the Sufi's ultimate response, however, or non-response, um, would prove a little bit more uh, difficult to gauge. Their very deliberate actions to ignore the event in their own way as a layer of ambiguity to uh, thinking about it purely in terms of resistance. Is re if resistance is deliberative action in response to antagonistic forces, how does deliberative forgetting uh, register? I think beyond simply resistance, however, we can think about it as a tactic, first and foremost. A tactic is both a method and a maneuver. It's an act that is calculated, purposeful, and intentional. A tactic is something that is designed to respond to a certain dilemma or obstacle. Thus, when considering the mystic's actions, one might categorize them as a form of a tactical endeavor, one that involves a certain mode of resistance, but is not wholly defined by it. In other words, the decision to not directly engage with the municipal government and the larger systems of power was a form of resistance by the fact that they chose to prioritize their metaphysical needs first, the primacy of the remembrance of God, thereby demonstrating the impotency and irrelevance of the state in light of their own epistemological and sort of spiritual framework. They began with civil tactics, but then they shifted their responses to address the needs of what the building was addressing all along, the spiritual needs of the faithful. In this way, the entire incident had been reframed as a spiritual exercise, as devoid of politics as they might make it, and unknowing of memory, which, given the context, is itself a highly politicized act. What does it mean to unknow a memory? This is all conclude with this. It's the strangest of exercises to question oneself at such a fundamental level, acting as both skeptic and believer, both pushing and pulling against a single idea, refuting information that exists, again, on the most fundamental of levels. Ultimately, this form of refutation of knowledge implements an instance of self-doubt so severe that it undermines not only the status the reality of places and things, but one's own cognitive faculties and emotions, compelling one to question the very nature of your own reality. Indeed, such an upending of reality outside of you know, some sort of psychotic break is only possible when the parameters of what constitutes reality itself might be reconfigured. And this is where the mysticism comes in. To demand such malleability from the real undermines the understanding of reality, of truth as a totality, that which is unchanging and exists as a temporally and ontologically contained whole. 
In the instance then, we must turn to Sufi understandings of what comprises that which might be considered real, uh, which shorthand is very different from what, what non-Sufis consider real. Furthermore, we must cons uh, also consider the epistemologies, the thoughts demanded by such systems of reality. It's in this way that we turn to Gnostic logic, to mystical logic. It is here that we might see how dream logic is in play. Within an unknowing of memory, no less a claim is made than the supremacy of the imaginary over the actual, the gentle daydream and its implementation rendered bold. In offering a group solution as to how to react to the destruction of their meeting place, the sheikhs have offered a united imaginary front. If reverie is conscious dreaming, then a poetics of reverie is a careful assemblage and shepherding of these ephemeral thoughts. Thus, by invoking their own mystical epistemologies, the Sufis attack the Fulad have contested not only the actions of the authorities, but the finality of the event itself. And I think I will leave it at that now. So, thank you. Thank you for uh, Thank you, Sima. That was such a wonderful talk. Um, we have uh, time for questions and uh, answers. Um, for those of you who's on Zoom, I believe you can type uh, your questions in the question box and, and then uh, one of us here in this uh, hall will uh, read out your uh, question. Um, uh, maybe I will exercise my moderator's privilege uh, and uh, ask you about some of the photos that, uh, that are up there. Uh, we didn't really uh, see um, any people uh, uh, yes, in, yeah. in the photos. Um, and um, are Sufis very particular about uh, secrecy? And, and, um, and if that's the case, how, might, how did you navigate uh, doing field work with, uh, with people who are you know, very concerned about being secretive? Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, yes, I don't have a lot of images with people. Uh, and that also makes it tricky for like publicizing material. <laughs> for like publicizing materials. I keep reusing the shrine photo again and again. Um, but uh, the Suvis were open to work, but they, there's a few things. Um, on the political level, they like to maintain a low profile. Um, and I can speak a little bit more about this, sort of their tenuous legal standing um, in Iran. Um, but also the secrecy is interesting in that um, it's also epistemological in that they find that <sighs> Um, they keep certain ideas, and a lot of these are very, again, abstract philosophical ideas, secret. Um, and, the, and the idea behind that is that you shouldn't be exposed to some of these philosophical concepts, these practices, until you are ready. Um, and no less than, you know, the ideas that if you don't, if, you're, if it's not in a proper sequence, these ideas, you can actually kind of go mad or lose it. Um, and that's why you really need to do it with a teacher. So there's also that kind of sense of secrecy. So lots of secrets and not a lot of images of people to so for both political reasons, um, but also more sort of spiritual, philosophical reasons. Right. But yeah. Thank you. Um, does anyone um, have questions? If you do, uh, please raise your hand and someone will come to you with uh, a mic. Uh, yes, uh, we have a question over there. Uh, uh, before you ask, uh, please also uh, introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Sam. Um, thank you so much for such a brilliant presentation. I think the introduction of your, of your writing as being really beautiful was very warranted. Uh, there were some passages where the, the music of your sentences just really were very refreshing and clear. Um, and yeah, like with all your technical difficulties, I, I found your, just, just your argument so compelling. Um, my question, I'm not sure if this is uh, appropriate for your discipline, but I'm curious about your own effective response as you were conducting this research. When you got to encountering those moments uh, of uh, those, those moments of refutation, those exchanges, was that immediately legible to you as, a, as this expression of a Sufi philosophy? Uh, would you, did you have moments where you were just like, what was going on? Oh, I was absolutely the latter. I did not know what was going on. Uh, this was, now it's like, oh, let me present these nice little groups. But I was like, I, I really questioned myself. Uh, I was like, uh, and I didn't know, and I also had to read their own kind of responses to it. Because first I was like, oh, yeah, it's, it's Tahli Fulad. Uh, and I, I don't know. And I was like, 
it was Tachtefulot, right? Like, I know I've been talking about this. Um, and the first time I was like, they must, I was sort of confused and I was like, maybe they didn't know, maybe they were away. Um, the thing that, so it was very confusing, uh, <laughs> quite frankly, and it was one of the harder moments of my ethnography, trying to figure it out, and at some point, that's why you record everything, um, because first I thought it was some sort of fluke. What helped me was that the one thing that kind of, I was lucky in that I kind of did it a little bit quickly, because I wanted to get it when it was fresher in people's minds. What helped was that it became clear that the closer I was to a person, just our own relationship, because um, there are people who kind of knew me as that like, you know, weird anthropologist who hung around, um, but I didn't know them at all, personally, and they were very kindly, you know, did interviews. Um, I could see that kind of correlation happening. So the people I was closest to, um, they gave me more, inf they spoke most directly about it. Um, and I could see it was a, uh, the folks who were not also were you know, giving them more the direct thing. So then eventually I was also able to talk to my friends that was closer, but the first few times I was really confused. And you also have to go with their own, how they're responding, because if there was one in particular that was like, let's not talk. And so you gotta be like, I'm not gonna push this. Others were like, no, no, it's, you know, it's fine. And I was like, are you sure? And then I wish I had kind of like reeled it in <laughs> back then, but yeah, thank you for that. Ah, uh, yes, here we are. Hi. Um, you've given us the very wonderful frame of amnesia in thinking about the way that the Sufis have done their forgetting. But how did or did also then Islamic thought and Islamic philosophy play a role in helping you come to that formula and that yeah. vision of amnesia? And was there a way in which the Sufis maybe indicated or very explicitly used Islamic thought and Islamic philosophy, maybe even the concept of fana, which in itself mm -hmm. is a process of forgetting yourself um, to, to help them do this, to help them be able to enact this amnesia. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I get that into the book, but I didn't mention that at all here. So um, really I looked at certain understandings of zikr, because that's mostly tied to zikr is often translated as remembrance or memory. But it's, uh, even that is, everything can get complicated in Sufi world. Um, so the idea behind the Zik ritual, um, and again, I mentioned like the whirling dervishes, a lot of it is categorized, or characterized, excuse me, by repetition. And so the idea is that you keep saying, you know, one phrase or one word, oftentimes it's, it's who after the Allah, who, so you keep repeating it. And the idea is you're invoking God, but in each moment there's a remembrance of God. And, but there's a, a philosopher, Abu Nas Saraj, and he says that, you know, true zikr, true remembrance is that you forget your zikr. And what he means behind that is that the moment they, the Sufis, they always want the intensity, so they want that feeling where you remember something. You know, it can be powerful, You're like, oh, I forgot, but I just remembered. Um, like, how do you capture that? How do you invoke that? And so this is why you have these repetitions where you forget but you remember, you forget and remember. And so with that, I was thinking about that as it's tied to this kind of moment here where it's, if anything, it's an active kind of engagement. So it's not the passive forgetting where you're like, oh, I forget, and then, you, and then if you remember, but it's this idea of also one actively trying to induce it. Um, and these different Zek philosophies which are about these moments, but also you know, the transformative capacity of, uh, of memory in particular. So, yeah, thank you. Other questions? Actually, are there? No, no, not, not yet, okay. Mm. Uh, yes, Kai. I was struck by how um, you characterize like memory culture in Iran as also like a very like political yeah. and politicized kind of like um, arena, right? So I was wondering um, whether like as we think of like Sufi purposeful forgetting of like kind of like state violence in some sense, mm. how that might intersect with like 
youth protests or like the Green Revolution and other kinds of like protests that also like in some sense like some kind of remembrance culture of, oh, is also kind of present there as well, right? To remember that these protests existed or that they were suppressed by the state or things like that as well. So I was wondering like whether like does that expand the question of like remembrance and amnesia in some way? No, that's really interesting. Thinking about how where is sort of the politics of memory as it relates to protest movements in Iran. Uh, so much of that is often especially tied to ephemerality. And I think they're trying to. It might, you know, my, um, I would think that the protesters are trying to call attention, are trying to have an awareness uh, to what's going on. Um, and because they... Um, are often, unfortunately, can be... There, there are protests in Iran that aren't always, like, immediately quashed. I don't want to think it's, like, this constant police state, although it's gotten a little bad. I think what they are trying to do is uh, inscribe different forms of memory in a slightly more oblique way, I've seen, because if something like... And you've seen this in the last year uh, with the Women Life Freedom protests... You know, if something that is like, you know, down with, you know, the dictators or whatever is written, that's going to be covered up quickly. But then people started using more ambiguous imagery. Um, and that, if you knew, became a sign. And so, uh, for example, there's uh, the one working class hero of the Shahnameh, the epic book of po kings, the epic poem from Iran, is this fellow uh, Kaveh, and he has a banner. So this banner, this literary this image from you know, classical literature started coming up. And I think that's a way of trying to make a presence felt, sort of rendering a material, um, some sort of material culture relevant that's there in a place that it's often tried to impose. So I've, my, the crude answer would be, which is super interesting to think about, is they're trying to sort of compete with the remembrance culture of the state. So it's probably a little bit more closer to that in a way. Uh, but yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there are two questions here. Um, uh, my name is Artin. Um, my question is, I think, related to Sherry R's um, on, on the fact that, or on the idea that uh, this willful amnesia is influenced by Islamic thought. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if, if there's a, because uh, as far as I know, there's a tradition of secrecy in Shia Islam as well. When if in terms of oh, like persecution, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I wonder if this willful amnesia or a related uh, movement would be present in other uh, thoughts in in Iran, like especially for for Shia Iranians. Um, yeah, I can think so. There's definitely secrecy within Shiism. I think you're thinking about taqiyya, which is this practice of, you can actually, it was it's a medieval, uh, medieval practice originally, where the idea was the Shias were so persecuted uh, at certain time periods that they were given permission from sort of the spiritual leadership to hide their authority, hide their identities, um, because the idea was that they were so persecuted if they were open about it that they would... Um, you know, that they would be killed and there would be no more Shias left. So, and I have to say, it's interesting now because that has fallen out of favor in the 20th century because it's sort of a stand up and fight and then ideas aren't as die, as, um, it's not as dire, thankfully. Um, so, I think there's a real esotericism within Shia thought. Um, and I kind of I go to this a little bit more in the book where even from the even beyond just the taqiyya, the political kind of hiding, um, there's notions of the hidden imam. Uh, there's a fellow, the, the last saint is there, um, and there's key figures within 20th century um, uh, Shia thought. Alamo um, Taba Tabai as a very influential cleric, and sort of pulls to that. And so I think there's a lot of, there's um, I, similar ideas of playing with memory within Shia thought. Um, there's actually a great book, it's, it's scholarly, but also kind of a theological book in that he's like a real believer, that's it, by Reza Shah Kazemi called Remembrance and Justice. 
Um, and that's tied to sort of how we invoke the memories of Imam Ali and these other figures. So there's certainly different forms of remembrance that I think exist within, the, I think your question is tying with questions of remembrance, but also with secrecy. You know, who is allowed to remember? Who is allowed to know? And in this case, if we can tie it to, you know, this collective, you know, they don't care about if people outside the collective know or know about their stance. Um, and so I think in that way, it's a form of remembrance that is tied to the sort of um, slightly more insular understanding of even the, the community, for sure. So yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Ziyang has a question. Hi, I'm Ziyang. I'm an anthropology senior um, from UNS College. Um, I really like your talk, especially regarding uh, memory. I was just wondering from your few work if you had any specific examples about forecasting, about ideas on visions, uh, oh. in which and how might that inform um, your analysis moving forward? Because a lot of the emphasis is on, I guess, history and the formation of history as an epistemological object. Um, but I, I work in Japan, imaginations of the future mm. and how that that kind of materializes as well in the present. So I'm just interested to learn more about how, how that, that might come into play. Yeah, no, that's a great question too. So there, on the one hand, there's not a lot of divination practices by the Sufi authorities, but I think that's interesting too because there's an emphasis on sort of the hyper-present that's there. I think the state is actually very... Um, but their forms of remembrance are very invested actually in the future. Uh, they're pulling from the past because there's because there's lots of fear of threat. You know, it's basically inscribing ideas that, you know, another attack could happen and this is future looking. Um, pull from the past, look to the future. The present is just kind of caught up in this um, panic kind of state. Uh, the Sufis, I think, are often very much interested in mm, the hyper present. And that's why they have these rituals where you're just saying things over and over again. Um, you're not trying to think about the future, and sometimes not even the past, um, just be there so there can be a collapse of kind of uh, uh, time, time in that way. So, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a question over there. Hi, thank you for the fascinating talk. Uh, I have a quick question. I'm coming from a historical background. Uh, I'm studying history here at YNC. And I was curious, uh, were there any similar precedents, um, if you happen to investigate them, uh, of people reacting differently or similarly to the destruction of, uh, say, uh, Sufi shrines? Uh, because from what I know, uh, Sufi communities were prosecuted in Persia for a long time. Yeah, so I don't know of any instances that were kind of similar to the reactions of the group I had, but I don't know if that doesn't mean it happened. But I will take up a larger question, if you don't mind, about the relationship between Sufis and the state. Um, so it's quite, um, it's really fascinating and complicated. Um, so if we think about sort of proto-Iran or, you know, proto-nationalist Iran, um, the Safavid dynasty, um, which is, you know, 1500s, they actually were a Sufi order themselves. Um, almost like a Sufi cult, they believed they were, you know, um, today they would call be like blasphemous in terms of like how they thought of their leadership. So you've had moments where Sufis were very much in positions of power. And uh, what's fascinating about that, not to get too off topic, but there's a great book um, by Atta Anzali and looks at within um, Iran today, there's different terms for the word Persian. I'm sorry, different terms for the word mysticism. There's Erfan, there's Marifat, and then there's Sufi Gari, uh, and also Tasavvuf. And the idea was that because the Sufis came, the Sufi order kind of came to power, and these were very militant, you know, um, sword wielding Sufis. These were not like the, what we think about, you know, meditating off into the corner. They wanted to distinguish themselves from other types of Sufis. So they say, no, no, you guys are practicing Sufism or Sufi Gari. What we're doing is mysticism, um, uh, which is Erfan or Tasavvuf. And even now in Iran, you have these bifurcations. And so, but it was really for political reasons. Um, so you've had moments uh, of 
um, much more persecution. You've had other moments when the state is actually much more sympathetic to Sufis. Um, my favorite example is actually Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, who, believe it or not, you know, had training in, not formal training, but he was very interested in mystical thought. He wrote mystical poetry uh, throughout much of his life. Even after he came to power in the 1980s, he, at the end of his life, he was writing these, and joking, this kind of quite emo poetry, where he uses Sufi motifs, like saying things like, uh, let's, uh, let's abandon the mosque and go to the tavern. Um, and so you have invocations, and this has been translated into English, and his estate has it up on you know, his website and things, so he hasn't disavowed it. Um, so, and during the time of the Shah, for example, um, you had some groups who were kind of in, close with the Shah, others who were not, who were quite critical of him. And I would say, too, even with the establishment of the Islamic Republic, uh, it was not that, oh, the Sufis had to go underground. It really varied from order to order. Some people absolutely left, and others, for example, were close to the Shah and his family, they left. But others stayed because they were more neutral. And the legal standing of Sufism in Iran is interesting in that it's quite unclear. Um, in the Constitution, they mention lots of, you know, what we would call religious minorities, perhaps, you know, Christians, Jewish groups, Zoroastrians, um, different Sunni fiqhs, uh, Sunni groups are all protected um, on, in the Constitution. Uh, one group that is not, they're not in the Constitution, but in other foundational documents are condemned are the Baha'is. So the Sufis, however, go unmentioned. They're neither condemned or they're not condoned. So what happens then is there's nothing on the sort of national level. And so the treatment of Sufis by the authority really varies by on the local level. Um, and so I think it really ties to this history of Sufism within the city. Um, some of the legal indicators we do have are things like there are VAC documents where are like, you know, legal deeds that, were, or, uh, that they're still, those are still being acknowledged. So it's a very roundabout way of saying, I don't know the exact instances, but the relationship has varied from harsh persecution to so using the seats of power. It's there, so yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Meherwan has a question. Hello, hi Prof hi. Seema. Thank you so much for sharing. This is really fascinating. Um, I had a few different questions and I'm coming from a bit of a psychological perspective here. Mm. It sounds like, there's some kind of active processing that's happening when the people who are close to you are speaking to you about um, the memory that they have, and the memory is very, very present for them. It's not something that they have forgotten. And um, at a separate level, when people are not, not you know, emotionally connected, as you said, not friends with you, um, they, there is some kind of passivity to it where they've like, you know, kept it behind bars. Would you say that it's similar to, would you call it repression? Because you said, like there might be repression of some trauma, or I, I want to understand like the nuance of whether it's something different from that, because it seems like there, it might be something different from that. So that's one of the questions that I had. And also in the people th that you spoke to, was the response gendered in some sense? And I'm not sure, like your inter interlocutors, I'm not sure if you want to reveal that, but was there some kind of gendered understanding of the way that this activity was done in a very, like, you know, in a Muslim dominant, country that, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so I actually don't think it's a type of, um, I think there's absolutely processing that's happening. I don't think it's a form of repression, at least if you go from more classical forms of, you know, of psychoanalysis or psychology. Because the classic idea is that with trauma and repression, it's very hard, it's very much that the, the tragedy will act upon the subject, uh, meaning there's something there and that you, without uh, volition, you know, you can't remember, you won't remember, uh, like, oh, I repressed it, but then you, you're not really supposed to be aware, if I understand, if, you know, that repress it. Same with trauma. Trauma is absolutely the idea that the event is gonna act on the person. Here, I think it's the other way around. I think the person is acting on the memory. So it's a very conscious kind of meditation. If that's a type of repression, that's, I think that's interesting to think about. You could say that too, and you know, 
uh, and this gets into more of the psychological literature, is can you have like an active oppression? That's possible. Um, or is the other way around? Um, so, but I do think it's different from the classic forms of trauma, at least, because again, it's so volitional. Um, in terms of gender, uh, that's a great question. I actually found quite a bit of a mix here. Um, maybe a bit more of more friends of mine were female, um, but not always. Um, and so I will say most of the groups I worked with, all the groups I worked with are mixed gender. Some of them were um, practiced much more se segregation of the sexes than on others. So in those cases, I hung out more with women. But I think it was, it, this is kind of classic anthro where, you know, as a woman, I think I actually had a little bit more access than if I was a man. Um, in that if you're a man, you're definitely not going to go into the women's kind of quarter. They're like, we don't care who you are. No way. The other way is if it's like a friendly kind of vibe and that they say, if you feel comfortable, then you can come um, to the men's section. So that was kind of the vibe. And in other places, the Subis were very mixed. Um, you'd have a big room, for example, where everyone is listening to a sermon or a musical performance. Um, and these are a little bit more underground uh, than you know, everyone would sing in one room. Um, and so in those cases, you had to be but all the orders I worked with were, you know, of mixed gender. And in this case, I, I didn't find actually a direct correlation. I would think maybe a little bit of younger folks, probably. But again, I think that's because of their relationship. So I mean, yeah, thank you. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, my name is Dylan. I'm a third year history student at Yon Yos College. Um, I just, at risk of sounding silly, like when we were talking about this process of like river amnesia, I kind of thought of the meme like, um, which, is, which is like a condensed version of the statement, to be delusional is the solution or to be delulu is the solulu. Yeah. Um, okay, I guess that's like being making a very deliberate process. Um, I guess my question was, in your fieldwork, did you find any examples of perhaps like um, people thinking or struggling to think about how they could like maintain this like um, framework of your amnesia. I'm just like thinking, what are, did you find any people who talked about like they're trying to forget or be amnesic, but like there's a struggle to like, oh, but the memory is just so raw and painful and I'm trying to forget, but I can't. And perhaps like yeah. um, transmitting this memory or this process, like perhaps like maybe one day um, some of the children might be like, mom, dad, what happened? And then like, oh, how do I approach this? Right. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point actually with the children because they're not doing any of that. Um, and they would just, I've heard people just, you know, they talked about it and, you know, they addressed it to them directly. Um, and no one expected them to sort of forget it. It's a really great question, and I did talk about it with friends, um, the people who I was closest to, but I didn't include it in the book, um, partially because they were, un they were a little bit uncomfortable with, it was kind of the official stance, you know, of the group, so they felt a little bit, you know, it's all anonymized, um, but that was my choice. Uh, and you could say that it was, you know, it could have, um, I hope it wasn't just kind of, you know, making the argument easier in a way, but I could sense that they felt sometimes a little uncomfortable talking about that um, because it was not what was said uh, in certain ways. And even, interestingly, I talked to the, you know, the, a lot of the thought we came up with, it was collective, but it was also the sheikhs who made the decisions. And I spoke to them about writing about this, you know, and uh, I, I, you know, there was a lot of ethical kind of quandaries. And they were, I think that's really interesting that they didn't want to be, uh, they didn't want to discuss this directly with me, but they say if the people talked about it, you can talk about it in this way. So I don't know, I have a lot of thoughts on that, but then I don't, it, this is where my place is like, I don't want to, you know, too much. So, but yeah, it was tricky. It was tricky to do and hopefully, they were okay. I think they said they were okay with it in the end. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we are out of time, but uh, we can certainly continue the conversation uh, at the reception. Uh, could you please join me and thank Professor Seema Gravisani for her thank wonderful for talk.